Edmonia Lewis was America's first successful African-American Chippewa Indian sculptor. She exhibited at the Centennial Exposition held in Philadelphia in 1876. She was the first black woman in America to have widespread recognition as an artist. This is one of Lewis's best known marble sculptures and her first complex two figure pieces. It's also the first sculpture by an African-American that celebrates the Emancipation Proclamation. At first she called this sculpture the morning of liberty. Today it's called forever free. She created this piece while living and working in Rome. It broke with neoclassicalism, yet it was influenced by neoclassicalism. She borrowed money to have it cut in marble. When she finished it, she had it sent without notice with a bill to the abolitionist lawyer and close friend of Garrison. She sent a letter explaining how it was a tribute to Garrison and she had presumed the money would be easily raised by the subscription among abolitionists. Unfortunately, she didn't know that most of the abolitionists by that time had grown old and were living on a pension and was unable to pay the bill for the sculpture. Fortunately, an African-American cleric um, paid the bill and he um, was able to take the piece for his congregation. Edmonia Lewis was more famous in Europe than in the US. She went to Oberlin College in 1857, 24 years after they opened their doors to women, Blacks, and Indians. It was a major abolitionist center that was founded by John Brown's father. She went to Italy in 1865, where she opened a studio. She's a self-taught artist who was greatly influenced by Greco-Roman sculpture. Her later works are considered more neoclassical. This piece called Hagar is about the biblical Egyptian woman who was cast out into the wilderness after bearing Abraham's child. She's depicted just having heard the angel asked, what aileth thee, Hagar? Edmonia strongly identified with Hagar after the Oberlin experience. I know you wanna know what was the Oberlin experience. Let's look at Edmonia Lewis while I give you this information. While at Oberlin College in January of 1862, Edmonia was accused and put on trial for poisoning two white female students who also boarded at John Keep's home, who was a retired theologian and Oberlin trustee. While awaiting trial, she stepped outside the back door one cold winter night. She was captured, dragged into the field behind the house and brutally and viciously beaten and left for dead. She was found unconscious with multiple bruises, contusions and exposure to the night air. The hearing was postponed as she was bedridden for weeks. When the trial was finally held, Edmonia had to be helped into the courtroom on the arms of her friend, John Mercer Langston an Oberlin graduate and the first African-American admitted to the Ohio bar defended Edmonia. He was concerned with the implications of the charges and the potential violent attacks on black people if the girls died. So in his investigation of the facts, he discovered that Spanish fly poisoning can only be established by the analysis of vomit, urine and feces. After interviewing their doctors and the girls, Langston moved for immediate dismissal because no proof had been provided that the girls were poisoned. Also, there were no motives or evidence. So Edmonia was acquitted, carried from the courtroom on the shoulders of her friends, mostly whites, and she resumed her studies. John Mercer Langston went on to become a congressman he was the founder of the Howard Law School and the United States Minister to Haiti. This piece called The Death of Cleopatra became Edmonia's greatest triumph. It is a striking portrayal of Cleopatra after an asp bit her. Edmonia received both acclaim and controversy for an intimate look at Cleopatra, atypical of how she's often portrayed, beautiful and strong. Death of Cleopatra is a two-ton sculpture which was presented at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition and later in Chicago. It was unveiled at the Philadelphia Exposition in 1876 
but it didn't sell like her smaller pieces. She later shipped and exhibited the sculpture at the Chicago Interstate Exposition in 1878. Many people went to see it, but still it did not sell. So she put it into storage because she couldn't afford to take it back or have it sent back to Rome. Over the years, this enormous piece was lost. Curator George Kearney thinks that the storage company sold it. Then in 1892, the sculpture turned up in a Chicago saloon on Clark Street. The owner of a, right, of a racetrack in Forest Park outside of Chicago bought it as a monument for his favorite horse. Of course, the horse's name was Cleopatra and placed it on top of her grave. The racetrack closed, it became a golf course and eventually in World War II, it became an ammunition factory. In 1972, the ammunition factory became a bulk US mail service facility. The statue was moved to a salvage yard and in 1988, a fire inspector found it in the salvage yard. Meanwhile, the statue deteriorated due to weather and careless handling. So in 1995, it was restored to his glory and it was placed in the Smithsonian National Museum of Art. The neoclassical painter of the French Revolution and the Napoleon Empire was Jacques Louis David. David was a distant relative of Boucher. He had followed Boucher's style until he visited Rome, where he became inspired by traditional classical art, as well as the academic teachings of the element of art, based on rules taken from ancient art and from the great masters of the Renaissance. David revived and combined the classical and academic traditions in his own style. He then rebelled against the Rococo style, which he said was artificial, imitating nature. He praised Greek art, even though he did not know anything about it until he won the French Academy in Rome, where he studied for six years the remains of ancient art and Italian Renaissance. However, he felt that art should, be, should educate the public and that French artists should behave as Greek artists who were granted liberty to express the ideals of their communities in perfect physical form. He was prepared as an artist and as a politician when the French Revolution started. It gave him the opportunity to create public propaganda art. He designed everything during the revolution, everything from clothing to hairstyles. David played many roles during the uh, French Revolution. He was part of the scholars and artists pursuing the revolution. He wanted the government to replace the French Royal Academy with groups of people who would be in charge of reforming public taste. Also, he became a member of the National Convention that voted for the death of King Louis XVI. His position of power made him a dominant official model for many years. This painting, called the Oath of Harati, once called Between the Hands of Their Father, was painted in 1784 before the French Revolution. It reflected his political ideals his power of the classical form, as well as his method of composing a neoclassical picture. He also believed in the enlightenment concept that subject matter should have a moral message and civic, civic virtue. The Oath of Haredi depicts a story from ancient Rome, yet it came directly from the 17th century tragedy, Horace by Pierre Cornelli, a classical drama that was popular with the very educated. From the heroic phase of Roman history that archeologists had discovered at Pompeii and Heraclum, David has portrayed a dramatic event from Roman history to heighten French patriotism and courage. The story of conflict between love and patriotism was a very popular theme. The leader of the Roman and Albane armies are posed for battle. They decide to resolve their conflict with a series of encounters witnessed by representatives from each side. The Roman champions, the Horatus brothers, will face the three sons of the Caratus family, the Albane warriors. David's painting shows the three Horatus brothers as they prepare to fight the enemy of Rome. Swearing an oath to the empire on swords held up 
by their father to win or die for Rome, an event imagined by the artist before the combat. This oath does not appear anywhere in the play or Canelli's ancient source. Their mother and other relatives collapse in despair. They weep for the men's safety, but they also are distraught because Sabina in the center is the wife of the youngest Horatus, the only warrior of the six to survive. She was a sister to the Karate. His sister Camilla in the far right is a Horatus, was engaged to marry one of the Karata's son. When her brother found her mourning, her beloved, he killed his sister. This is family against family and a conflict that neither can win. As you can see, the theme is depicted with force and clarity in a shallow picture box in a simple ar architectural framework. The artist enlarged the canvas by 50% without permission from the state who paid for it. David knew that this large history painting would be hung near the ceiling in a, what's called the salon style. So all the statuesque figures occupied a space very close to the foreground without a transition, remnant of ancient relief sculpture, harsh sculptural lines that define the figures and settings, emotional responses barely evident in the idealized classical faces of the figures. This painting created a sensation when it was exhibited in Paris in 1785, even though it was painted on the royal patronage and was not originally intended as a revolutionary painting. Its neoclassical style soon became the semi-official voice of the revolution designed to heighten French moral standards. After this painting, David's art became increasingly more political. The death of Marat has been considered one of the greatest masterpieces of Western art. It's about Jean Paul Marat, who was a major figure during the French Revolution. He was a propagandist, extremist, a populist writer who was in a way responsible for the execution of many aristocrats by the guillotine. Marat was the hero of the organized movement of artisans and workers in the poor neighborhoods of the city, or as they say, and I quote, friend of the people. He had a skin disease, so he spent days in a bathtub which was fitted with a writing desk. The papers on the edge of his writing stand show that he had been dispatching some money to a soldier's widow when he was surprised by the killer. Charlotte Godet, a political enemy of Marat, a counter-revolutionary, was angry with his excessive backing of the guillotine. She gained entry to his house with a list of traitors. Then she stabbed him to death. The artist David was commissioned to produce a painting to symbolize the martyr. So he memorialized Marat with this painting as a saint, and I quote, friend of the people. Believe it or not, this image is meant to console the viewers of that time. David has depicted the aftermath of the fatal attack with directness and simplicity and clarity. His composition reveals his close study of Michelangelo, especially his Christ in the Pieta and St. Peter's in Rome. The death of the Marat is convincingly real, yet is composed to present Marat as a tragic martyr who died serving the state. The death of Socrates by David, or Socrates at the moment of grasping the hemlock, this composition unfolds parallel to the picture plane, like a relief sculpture, very similar to the last two. The figures are as solid and immobile as a statue, yet the male bodies are different than the oath, more masculine like Greek ideal sculptures. The harshness of the design suggested David was passionately involved in the issues of his time, artistically as well as politically. Socrates refuses to compromise his principles. He was convicted on trumped up charges and sentenced to death. He is shown about to drink a cup of hemlock, surrounded by his followers. In Plato's account of the suicide, the jailer with poison was an anonymous minor. 
Yet in David's pain, Socrates reaches for the cup and the boy at the same time. Socrates was apparently sexually abstinent. David has depicted him like a Christ figure with his 12 disciples, although fewer people were present in the real death. Even his wife has been omitted from the scene. This is a Greek painting with the appreciation of Greek love. At the end of the French Revolution, David barely escaped with his life. He was imprisoned many times, yet was able to paint. When the French monarchy was restored in 1815, David went into exile in Brussels where he, where he spent his final decades. In the middle of the 18th century, the modern era emerged with the Industrial Revolution. Religion no longer had a dominant role. Science and technology challenged old views of the physical world. Political revolution challenged the old absolutism of church and monarchy that had originated in the Middle Ages. Following the upheaval of the French Revolution of 1789, a chain of counter-revolutions and civil wars in Europe and America continued. 19th century Europe was an age of radical changes in which the modern world took shape as the world began to experience a population explosion. European government extended their rule into the colonies of Africa, the Americas, India, Asia, and Australia. In France, David demanded his students select neoclassical subject matters. However, his students made many choices. Some preferred ideals based on what they could learn from classical sculptures, such as this one. The ideal as opposed to the real was based in Greek sculpture. The concept of the perfect human beauty had been embodied in their sculptures. They also felt it was the artist's purpose to capture beauty and that painting should learn from sculpture learn such things as simplicity, smooth surfaces, flowing contour, and minimal chiaroscuro. They felt that color distracted from the senses. Nude figures were considered the best form for expressing the ideal composition. The nude or, partial or partially draped figure should emulate bas-relief sculpture and should be symmetrically balanced. Now, of course, very few paintings were able to achieve this ideal. It was hard for artists not to mix the ideal with the real or the ideal form with the existing subject matter. Jean Augusta Dominique Eng was a brief student of David's during the 1790s. He left because he felt that he had a purer Greek style than David. Eng adopted a flat linear form, like those found on Greek base paintings. In most of Aang's work, the figure is placed in the foreground, like a bas-relief sculpture, yet he has flowing contours, shaded lines, is characteristic of Aang's style. In both form and content, critics initially saw Aang as a kind of rebel. Yet Aang's art still maintained elements of the official neoclassical ideal. This painting called La Grande Odalesque was highly criticized when it was first shown. Critics said that she had three vertebrae too many and she had no bones, no muscle or life. The figure is treated in Aang's own sculpturesque style with polished surfaces, simple rounded shapes with flowing contour. However, the reclining nude is traditional, and it goes back to Georgione and Titian in the 16th century. This is, um, this is a piece by, uh, called Ven Venus of Urbino by Titian from, 1530, from 15, uh, 1538. And again, this is the model for the reclining nude in the modern world. However, Aang changed the figure to a member of a Turkish harem, which is the artist's romantic taste for the exotic. He borrowed Raphael's female head. The manner has also influenced him. 
Her pose and proportion, small head and elongated limbs, and her generally cool scheme were much like the mannerist Parangina. Aang became the most renowned neoclassical artist of the 19th century. The classic artist was concerned with essence and with the showing a thing as it is. As stated, they used clean outlines and linear forms found on Greek vase paintings. The classical artists created a stable world by emphasizing vertical and horizontal lines. Also, the classic artists tend to place figures across the picture plane, creating a series of parallel planes. The classic artist tries to create absolute clarity with each part of the image clearly represented, as you can see here. The classic artist Aang inscribed his, his age in this particular painting. His age in this particular painting when he made this painting was 82. Aang believed that the woman's place was in the harem. But also Aang had never visited a harem. Aang was influenced by the stories that his friends told him of a harem. And as you can see, the harem, the women in this harem are all idealized. Again, because he didn't have the experience. The neoclassical work of Aang is precise, is based on outline. The contours are exact. There's no obvious brush strokes. The surfaces are very polished, smooth. Color is used essentially to fill in the contours. It's most often kind of subdued as you see in this particular piece. The neoclassical artists had some concern for anatomy. Most often their figures are shown in some sort of rest pose position. Now remember that neoclassicalism was a popular style at the end of the 18th century that continued into the 19th century, especially in architecture and sculpture. 